Okay, it is 615. I will call this meeting to order as we have a quorum of the board president. If everyone would please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The Honorable have roll call, please. Okay. Bobby Braun, Jill Maddock Nelson, Kristen Matt Miller, Scott Peterson. Here. Kathy Solon. Here. Catherine Solon, sorry, my dear. Uh, Angie Schreiber. JD Schrader. Here. Dr. Bardot. Here. And Danny Pipe. Here. I just want to remind everybody we've been getting some feedback from the community. Uh, please bring your microphones up close to you uh, so everybody can hear during the recording. Uh, item D, public comment. Did anybody sign in there? We have nobody signed in there. Uh, Mrs. Ojinski wants to make a statement here during public comment. Um, Mr. Wilhelm, can you also project the document? So this is in response. We've had some um, of our community members reach out with questions around our timeline for our budget hearing. So we want to ensure clear communication regarding our district's classification and timeline for budget-related matters. As a unified school district, we operate under specific guidelines distinct from common or union school districts. This classification requires that our budget adoption and levy approval occur on or before November 1st. As we move forward with our current referendum, the process for our, budgeted, our budget adoption and levy approval will differ from our usual approach. Running a referendum involves additional coordination to ensure accuracy and alignment with our referendum goals. In preparing for the budget and levy adoption, we are working closely with partners such as PMA Securities, our financial advisors, and Quarles and Brady, our legal firm. Their expertise is essential in drafting precise motions for the budget and levy adoption, ensuring they reflect the specific needs and goals of the referendum. We appreciate the understanding from our community as we na navigate these additional steps, and we thank you for your continued support and engagement throughout this process. Thank you, Ben. Okay, moving to item E, annual budget hearing. I will turn this portion over to Mrs. Fossbender. All right, so welcome to the 2024-25 budget hearing. For today, our agenda is going to be looking like a budget timeline, the budget highlights, a high level highlight of our revenues, our budget adoption format by fund, an overview of our fund balance, cash flow, um, and a brief overview of enrollment for vouchers, and then budget priorities. So our budget timeline from a high level in November to December, we're really starting to already work on next year's budget. And that is reviewing preliminary budgets, forecasts, um, including enrollment projections, revenue expenditures, and beginning to plan for new initiatives. January through June, we're looking at updates to revenue limits and other revenues, determining staffing levels and associated costs. In July and through September, that's when we're looking, like uh, Ms. Ojinski talked about, if you were a common or union school district, you are doing your annual meeting and public hearing. We operate on a different timeline. We are also reviewing and analyzing prior year results, tracking changes from our preliminary budget and final budgets, and then updating our forecast model with the latest known variables. And then in October, Again, we're updating our revenue limit worksheets with known figures, re reviewing our internal revenue limits and equalization aid worksheets with October 15th final uh, certification information, and then our budget, our board adopts our final school tax levy and budget. And then, of course, we certify our levies with our local municipalities in the beginning of November. 
That high level budget overview um, looks like property tax. We will get into the differences between if the referendum passes, what that will look like versus if it does not. Our equalization aid, which again, that's that aid that's provided by the state. We had a significant increase this year due to the strategies that the school board and administration has put into place. So we have about a 1.2 million dollar increase from last year. Our pupil per pupil categorical aid is about 1.5 million, and then our revenue limit, again last year went from 10,000 to 11,000, and then we have a $325 increase per member this year. Our transportation aid is about $92,000 as well. Just in high level overview of revenues again, one of the things that I'd like to point out that we that differs from last year significantly and in prior years from 2020 to 2021 is that we no longer have federal stimulus grants. ESSER was one of those pieces. So there it was a variety of federal stimulus grants that we got from 2020 to 2024 totaling $7.9 million. Those are no longer within our operating budget, so there's significant differences this upcoming budget than there has been in the past several years. Kelly, is, is there an actual budget book? Or yes, mm -hmm. and that will come out when we have what the final levy is going to be after the referendum. Mm -hmm. oh. So fund 10 is going to be the first fund that we look at in our proposed budget, and that's the general fund. So your general fund is that operating fund, is the operating fund of the district, and it's used to account for all financial resources of the district, except those that are required to be accounted for in other funds, which we will go through. So looking at this first section of the general fund, you'll look at our ending fund balance, and that was 8.177304.34. And you're looking at the subtotal for our local sources being 8864200 And then our subtotal with other school districts within Wisconsin, and that is 358176 Looking at our subtotals for intermediate sources is about 12,000, and then our state sources is 19,260,532. Here's where you're going to see your significant differences with your federal sources at, at 1.249709, and then your other financi financing sources is diff a little bit different than last year at zero, and then our total revenues is 29781617 for Fund 10. So then we're looking at our expenditures in Fund 10, and in that instructional section, that's 12188502 Looking at our support services, this is an area that's significantly different as well due to the fact that there were several cuts um, because of ESSER funds, this was a large area that funded that area. So that'll be 10967937 And then the last section is the subtotal for the non-program transactions at 6625700 or $178. So if you're looking at our total expenditures versus our total revenues, they are equal. Next is our Fund 27, that's our special education fund. This fund is used to account for the excess cost of providing special education and related services for students with disabilities during the regular school year or extended school year. The revenue sources here are your federal IDEA and preschool grants, state categorical aid, Medicaid reimbursements for student-based services, and support from the general fund. That support from the general fund is the Fund 10 to Fund 27 transfer amount. That's determined by subtracting the fund expenses from state and federal education revenues. Mrs. Fassbender, could you wait just one second? 624 will show a board member arriving. Thank you. And then in this fund, there's no fund balance or deficit that can exist in this fund, so that's why there's that transfer. So in looking in revenues, you'll see that transfer from Fund 10 is 2.583776. And then moving down to intermediate sources differs a little bit from last year at zero. Moving on to state sources, it's 1.2 million. 
and federal sources is 776,726. And your total revenues come to 4.56, or 4,560,502. And then that equals, looking at expenditures, you can see that our instructional expenditures are 3,248,422. Support services is 820,240. And then you'll see that our total revenue and expenditures equal. The next funds we're going to look at is Fund 21. That's the, the special revenue fund for donations and fundraising. Remember, this account or this fund is used to account for the proceeds of donations and fundraising. Expenditures are limited to specified purposes related to district operations. <coughs> and there may be a fund balance in this fund. So this is funds 21, 23, and 29. And our revenues are expected to be 25,000. That always varies every year. And then the total expenditures are 136,102. The next two funds is Fund 38 and 39. We are currently not using Fund 38, which is that non-referendum debt service fund. We will be, if the referendum passes, using Fund 39, which is your revenue debt service fund. So on the top, you'll see if the referendum fails, you will have zero in Fund 39. And if the referendum is approved, you would have revenues um, of 2,876,269 and expenditures of 2,300,047,250. The next funds we will look at is Fund 41, 46, 48, and 49. So this dot should be down here. Um, Fund 46 is the one that we would be, that we have been utilizing. That's the long-term capital improvement trust fund, which we've talked about quite significantly for the past several months, looking at our focus to build a long-term capital improvement fund and also be able to capitalize on state aid, reducing taxpayer impact. And then if the referendum passes, we would be using Fund 49, which is our capital projects fund. So on the next slide, you'll see that if the referendum does not pass, we would have only Fund 46 money in there with, the end, with total expenditures of $1.7 million. Mrs. Fassbender, just let the record reflect. Kristen coming in at 628. Thank you. And if the referendum passes, that is what the budget would look like at the bottom with your total revenues of $27 million and expenditures of $21,700,000. So how much is in Fund 46 alone? Which line is that? The top. So one of the things I'd like to point out um, on the top here is that we had a really significant fund balance, tran or Fund 46 transfer from Fund 10, which is $2.5 million. And the reason for that is because there was a significant amount of ESSER funds that we that had not been spent in three years and would have been lost at the end of the year if they were not expended. So we did a significant amount of aligning the budget to ensure that these funds were utilized, which created a significant amount of money that we were able to transfer into our Fund 46 to gain interest for the district and then also additional state aid, which doesn't mean it's additional money for the district. It just means that it is lower taxpayer impact which has been something that we've been focused on significantly. So if you fun spend Fund 46 and the referendum passes, does that get even more state aid, or is that? Once your funds are in for Fund 46 and you spend it, you don't get state aid on it, but when you are transferring it from Fund 10 to Fund 46, you get state aid that next year. Now, if the referendum does not pass, you, as you see on the bottom, you would not have additional spending. So you will lose additional aid from passing the referendum if, if that does not pass. And I do not see, because of the fact that ESSER 3 was a one-time large significant amount of money, $4.8 million, I'm not anticipating that we're going to have anything like that again. That was due to COVID. So unless we have another large pandemic, I'm not sure, or some sort of event like that, I'm not sure that we would be seeing anything like that in the future, near future. 
The next fund is Fund 50. That's our food service fund. These funds are used to account for and report transaction of the district's food and community service activities. No K-12 instructional or instructional support related functions are recorded here. All revenues and expenditures related to pupil food service activities are recorded in this fund. A fund balance in the fund food service fund is permitted. There may be no deficit in the district's food service fund. Any food service fund deficit resulting from student food services must be eliminated by an operating transfer from general fund, which is very similar to the fund 27. But we don't have that issue. We actually have a fund balance um, that we will be looking to improve our food service um, programs, as well as if the referendum passes, how we can utilize that within the new buildings. So fund 73 so is... Can I ask a question on that? If the referendum passes, can we, we can use fund 50? For certain um, related funds that would qualify from fund 50. Because historically, correct me if I'm wrong, we've had to spend down from Fund 50, correct? Yes. Which has at times been a challenge, although it sounds like it shouldn't be, but so we correct. can utilize those funds where it fits. Yes, I think that it's all in alignment with what our priorities are, which are optimal healthy food for our children. So looking at what are we currently serving them, and then what would the facility needs be that would be allowable from that fund, and then really trying to optimize all of the funds that we currently have to fit the plans that we have in the future. So the next fund is Fund 73, that's your employee, employee Benefit Trust or other post-employment benefits. So this fund, in 2006 and 7, an employee trust fund was created. This was a result of the Governmental Accounting Standards Board, Statement 45, that requires school districts to provide more complete and reliable finan financial reporting regarding post-employment benefits for their employees. The statement addresses the costs and future obligations incurred when post-employment benefits such as health insurance are provo provided for retirees. The district was required to determine the OPEB liability for financial reporting through the actuarial valuation. Contributions can be made to the trust to pay for future post-employment benefits, and the contribution is eligible for both equalization aids and categorical aids. So a little history here, the district made its last payment to the OPED portion of the trust, and there are sufficient funds within the trust to cover all future post-employment health benefits. Funds within the OPED portion are managed by PMA and invested with Wisconsin Investment Series, Series Cooperative. In 2012 and 13, the school board revised the OPED benefit for teachers and support staff, thereby re significantly reducing the long-term liability of this benefit. The benefit was changed from a defined benefit plan to a defined contributions plan for teachers that was and was eliminated after the 2014-15 school year for support staff. A premium only retiree health reimbursement arrangement was established with Mid-America. Annual contributions are made to eligible staff and placed on a fixed annuity. Employees have the ability to manage their account and can transfer their funds to various investment options. The board approved expanding the HRA to include reimbursement for unused accumulated sick leave in 2017. This benefit was made available for both teachers and support staff. Finally, the most recent change to the plan occurred in 2021 to expand the benefit to include health premiums and all eligible reimbursement, reimbursable medical expenses. So you'll see here that in the PMA account, the beginning balance was $352,158.09. The ending balance was $317,279.14, which is significantly down from last year because people are, um, uh, people are growing out of that plan. Mid-America started at the beginning balance was $2,200,274.70, and the ending balance was $2,152,611.87, for a total of $2,469,891.01.
The next fund we'll look at is Fund 80. This is our community service fund. This fund is used to account for activities such as adult education, community recreation programs, elderly food service programs, non-special education preschool, daycare services, and other programs which are not elementary and secondary educational programs but have a primary function of serving the community. In our district, this fund is used for the Community Aquatic Center. The expenditures from the Aquatic Center are offset by revenues generated through user and membership fees, rentals, class offerings, and donations. So the beginning, the total revenues are 486,500, and our expenditures are equaling that. Fund 91, 93, and 99 is not something that we have in our district, but these funds are designated for programs that are outside the dis out that our district may host or offer to other districts. This is programs such as RVA. Medford School District has RVA, so they would have funds such as this. This is our fund balance allocation. So as you can see, our dental is at 479,801 and five cents. We have unspent common school funds of $94,399.46. To speak to that a little bit, because of the fact that we had $4.2 million of ESSER funds that we had to spend or we would be losing them back to the government, we had to look at how we could optimize carryover in certain funds that we could utilize this year when we would lose those millions of dollars. So you'll see um, grant carryover that you normally wouldn't be seeing, but we needed to utilize the, the ESSER three funds first. So HRA, you'll see that's at $1,308,668.68. We have cash flow and emergencies in the unassigned fund balance of $5,636,466.86. And then again, that grant carryover, which is primarily AGR, which we do have plans for, but again, because we wanted to utilize ESSER 3 and optimize our Fund 46 transfer, that is why the carryover is there. Looking at cash flow, so one of the things that we talked about at our last board meeting was um, short-term borrowing. So one of the things that we do in collaboration with PMA is that we analyze our cash flow yearly to ensure that we are in good fiscal health. These charts provide a visual representation of the actual monthly revenues and expenditures from July 2023 through August 2024. And as you can see, those revenues are highest in the months where this is um, the time where we get equalization aid and tax receipts, which you'll see the months there. The notably low months are October and November, and those lead to our district experience, experiencing account balance at a low point. Our low point doesn't, um, need, doesn't have a need for short-term borrowing, but that's just one of those things we like to have in place in case there would ever be something that would come up. And again, interest does not happen unless you would utilize the, that short-term borrowing. Expenditures remain much more level throughout the year, peaking in months with triple payrolls and oftentimes in July when the annual Fund 46 contribution is made. This is just another chart showing the total revenues in blue, the total expenditures in orange, and then the checking and investment totals in green. So you can see where we fall. We aren't in need of short-term borrowing. One of the things that comes up in the community, which sometimes is not understood totally, so I'd like to have just a minute to talk about the Wisconsin Parental Choice Program and the impact to the budget. So what the Wisconsin Parental Choice Program is, is vouchers that are that the, the private schools who actually participate get. Um, all Saints is not one of those programs. Peace Lutheran is. Um, and then we have additional ones. We have Shepherd's Watch, which is as well. And then there's a whole list on DPI of which ones. But those are the ones that are closest to us. So one of the things that's misunderstood about the amount of vouchers is that it is on our district's tax levy. So that is money that actually does not support our district. It goes directly to the voucher private school. So on our tax levy that we'll talk about tonight, there's 
million, almost $1.6 million of tax levy that is going on to the mill rate. So that is for private schools and the parental choice program. And again, All Saints is not part of that. Peace Lutheran and Shepherd's Watch are. What's the, what's, how much is going to Shepherd's Watch? I would have to look at the chart online and because of the fact they're so new, I'm not, I can look into that and see if I can find the information on, on which schools and how much they get. So next we'll talk about mill rate. We won't go too far into depth, but I have some historical charts that I'd like to show you. So two things that significantly impact the mill rate are equalized valuation and equalization aid. So remember the equaliz equalized valuation refers to the total taxable value of all property within the school district. And remember we have 19 municipalities, some in Shawano, some in Marathon, and then some in Langlade. This ensures uniform property assessments across the different municipalities. This is important because property values can vary very, very significantly between local assessors, so the state equalizes these values to create a fair and consistent comparison across the state. The mill rate is the amount of tax per thousand dollars of property value that a school district needs to collect to meet, meet its budgetary needs. It is calculated by dividing the total amount of money the district needs to raise through property taxes, which is the levy, we'll talk about that later, by the district's equalized valuation and then multiplying by 1,000. One of the things that in, the, in our 19 municipalities is that our equalized valuation increased, and you can see that increase on the screen. So it increased pretty significantly, which again, when that increases, then your mill rate decreases one of the factors. Um, equalization aid is the amount of money that is provided by the state to support K-12 public education. Equalization aid for the Unified School District of Vanigo for 24-25 school year was $16,483,136, which is a significant increase from last year of $15,237,083. And again, this impacts the mill rate and also lowers the taxpayer portion. One of the th questions that community members typically have is what, how, what is one of the key components of our state funding formula and how do they determine what the distribution of aid is? So districts with less property value per member are aided at a higher percentage than districts with higher values per member. Here is a look at our mill rate and how is it is actually at historic lows. So if you'll take a look at, oh, it, this goes all the way back to 1984. Just looking at 1992, it was at $19.02. In 2000, it was at $10.08. Looking at fall of 2011, it was $9.24. And even as close as fall of 2020, it was at $8. Currently, we are the second lowest mill rate since 1984 at $6.21. The, the K-12 average, that's state average? Yes. Thank you. Where, where is it say fall 2024? 24 is not up there. 24 is not up there yet. Okay. So last year, it was 621? Correct. Yes. What was it the year before that? 499. Now remember, between 2022 and 2023, the legislator increased the revenue limit from 10,000 to 11,000 per member. So you d will see a significant increase because the year after that is when you get aided on that increase. Let me know when you'd like me to click. I know people are looking. All right. So here's another visual. This is the same numbers, but just shows you a little bit of a different view. So even with the passage of the referendum, our 24-25 mill rate would be the fourth lowest on record, demonstrating this school board and this administration's commitment to maintaining fiscal responsibility while addressing the needs of the district.
Just to highlight the budget priorities. Kelly, so does whatever the one dollar about what we were talking about before, is that a different number after the equalization value changes? Can you? I can answer it. Yeah. Okay. Answer is yes. I just wanted to understand what, yeah. We had told people that we were going, you know, we were at 621 and we said, if we do this, it's going to go up a dollar. It's going to go up 95 cents. Okay. So you're saying it's going to go up five cents less? Than what we projected. Because the value. equalized value went up. And are we still technically a low? Are mm -hmm. we still technically a low property value district, even though our values went up so much? Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. because it's based. It's based on what we get per child. We went to, we were ten thousand per child, and then. They in the last biennium they made it eleven thousand, and low spending districts could also add three hundred and twenty-five, more dollars. That's the right number, correct? Mm -hmm. This year, yes, yeah, not last year. Yeah. So we went to eleven three twenty five. Mm -hmm. Then it jumped from four ninety nine to six twenty one, and that's what we're basing everything on. This referendum is on the six twenty one. Now it's going to go up ninety five cents if we pass the referendum. Instead of the dollar. Instead of the dollar. Yes. And if we didn't qualify. Meaning, if the how our district falls within the state funding formula, the amount that we would pay on our mill rate for this referendum would be significantly higher, over two dollars. So, it is a significantly lower mill rate than what other districts would see. Did we? What happens in the second and third, the, the later years of the referendum? That's that why it? Eric's here. He's he's going to make a presentation once we get into where we have a motion for the budget. Okay. He's he's, he's going to be available to ask for all board members to ask and get answers to questions. Mm -hmm. All right. So just to summarize the budget priorities that we've talked about over the last year of us being with you, we are working on leveraging grants to minimize lower and lower taxpayer impact, maximize state aid, and then maximize our student achievement. We are also looking at prioritizing our facilities and infrastructure, safety and security, sustainability of high impact programs with data to support that, and then maximizing our state and federal funding. So this slide is going to also pull us into our next meeting, but these are how the levies will break down when you make your motion on the levy. So if there is a failed referendum, you'd be looking at fund 10 of 8,774,000, and then just as usual, the fund 80 would be 300,000 for a total levy of 9,074,000. If you had a past referendum, again, your fund 10 would be 8,774,000. Fund 39 would be 2,876,269, and then same up for your fund 80 at 300,000 for a total levy of 11,950,269. Just keep that there for a sec. Yep. You could keep that up too if you wanted, Ben, when they talk about their motions for a levy. So you're saying we're only paying half of the debt, the fund 38, fund 39, because the other half is getting paid by the state aid. That's why it's two million dollars, but we're only paying one dollar. Can we go back to fund 38, 39, that one? Mm -hmm. On 39, if we can go back to there. And we and will have time it. for discussion with Eric around all of this in our next meeting. Okay, 
so we look up there at Fund 39, and you see that if it doesn't pass, there's nothing in it. That's the levy or the budget at $9 million. And then you see that there's the two million eight seventy six two sixty nine, which adds up and makes it almost $12 million. Now, the thing you got to remember, anytime you do a new levy where you're adding two like this, the first year, it's all on us. We don't get state aid on any of that this year. Next year, you'll see a significant over 60% of that will have money coming in from the state and our two million eight, and I'm sure Eric will talk about this, will go significantly down because they'll be paying more of it than we are. And then the kicker, how old are you now, JD? 39. When you're 61 and this, and this is done, that next year, we get the state aid and, and don't have to pay anything. I'll look forward to that. <laughs> that would be great. But that's how it goes. They don't pay us the first year. It's always a year behind. So this year, we're paying everything. And then starting next year, state aid kicks in. And that's why we've said all along, we're going to pay about $31 million, and they're going to pay about 49 49 of, of principal and interest over yeah. the life of the bonds. Yeah. I was trying to do the math towards 80 million. Didn't want to make a mistake. But yeah, this year it's all on us, and then state aid kicks in for the next 20 some years. And what Eric has done and he's going to tell us about is he has planned it out based on the 610 and the 95 cents, 716, and it'll basically go like this the whole way. However, what will happen as equalized aid comes in every once in a while, it will dip. Now, of course, if we get at some point where the, we have a biannual budget which allows us to increase our state aid, the smart thing, of course, is to do that. And the other thing we have to remember is if, that, if we had not lifted our low 10,000 up to the 11,000, we wouldn't even be eligible for this. And we didn't know that at the time. So we actually got lucky that we did what we needed to do for the best for our kids and our teachers. I'm talking, I'm talking about the program where the state's doing so much for us that they're so it, you're saying if you don't take your full low revenue and we increase, wouldn't have qualified you don't get you can't get extra money for building referendums that's what we were told hmm. well that's where kelly said it would have been two dollars too too higher on the mill rate because we qualified for this special program okay so when does it get into the part where it's tertiary aid and secondary aid and different percentages is that during your part that someone that always comes up at some point. I think Eric is. Yeah, I can that one. yeah. One of the things we have to remember too, though, is there's two tertiary and a tertiary that you don't get aided on. We are nowhere close to that. So the tertiary that we would qualify for, we still get aided on. It's just at a lesser rate, but you still maximize all of your secondary aid reimbursement and you're moving into tertiary, which is less, but you're still getting state aid on it. Can we go back to this slide with Fund 46? Because I always like to talk Fund 46. Okay. The big thing here is that we put in, as Kelly said, about 2.5 million into Fund 46 this year. And that's because they were able to use the ESSER funds and moving what would have we would have paid out of Fund 10 into there. 
so we had that big extra. We're not going to have that big extra anymore. We need to be aware of that because our budget, our Fund 10 budget, is going to get tighter and tighter and tighter. So this is the last time you're going to see a big move into there. One thing I asked Kelly to do was, what if we had taken that 2.5 and put it in fund balance? And in the formula page, you can move money around to see what, would it, what it would have been. So we took what she put into fund balance, or not into fund balance, we took it out of fund 46, put it into all that 2.5 million into the fund balance on the sheet. Our taxes to our public would have been $1.365 million more. That's how much extra taxes we're getting in our Fund 10 this year that we wouldn't have got if we hadn't have moved it into Fund 46. The other part I want you to know is that I had it in my head just a second ago. This is a problem with turning 73, JD. Um, then I ask her, okay, what's the mill rate if we had put it all in there, in the fund balance? Our mill rate this year would be, without doing the uh, referendum, it would be 6.25. And what was it, what was it, I forgot what it was. 621. We actually, if we would have put everything into fund balance, our mill rate without the referendum would have been higher than last year. So just some tidbits to tell us and the public what Mrs. Oginski and Mrs. Fossbender did in the past year, save this district a lot of money. There's nothing to sneeze about the state giving us 1.365 million dollars. All right, so if there's no more questions, this tax levy will have further discussion on the next in the next meeting as an agenda item for setting the levy and then also adopting the two budgets that were presented which are attached in the next meeting. Are there any other questions for Mrs. Fossbender on the presentation that is before you? If there are no other questions of the uh, 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 annual budget hearing, then I will entertain a motion to adjourn this meeting. Move to adjourn. Motion to adjourn by Dr. Bardo. All in favor of adjournment of this budget hearing meeting, let it be known by saying aye. 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 Any op opposition? This meeting is adjourned. I do want to remind all the board members to please bring your mics close to, uh, I heard Mrs. Wojcinski say something to Dr. Vardo uh, whenever we're speaking into the mics because we're having some uh, people that are watching. Thank you, Kristen, for... I, I had that on my mind to do that. Is it projecting live on this one and delayed? No, it's oh. not live. It's still recorded. But if you don't have them up close enough, that the, our community cannot hear. Okay. Everybody ready? Okay. It is 6.59. I will call this uh, special meeting to order. If everybody would please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The honor roll call, please. Joe Maddock Nelson. Here. Kristen Matt Miller. Here. Scott Peterson. Here. Catherine Solon. Here. Angie Schreiber. J.D. Schrader. Here. Dr. Bardot. Here. Bobby Braun. Danny Pyatt. Here. 
Uh, letter D, public comment. I don't think anybody signed up, but we do have a statement from Mrs. Ojinski uh, that will be read and also uh, up on the screen. Thank you, Ben. We want to ensure clear communication to our community regarding our district's classification and timeline for budget-related matters. As a unified school district, we operate under specific guidelines distinct from common or union school districts. This classification requires that our budget adoption and levy approval occur on or before November 1st. As we move forward with our current referendum, the process for our budget adoption and levy approval will differ from our usual approach. Running a referendum involves additional coordination to ensure accuracy and alignment with our referendum goals. In preparing for the budget and levy adoption, we are working closely with partners such as PMA Securities, our financial advisors, and Quarles and Brady, our legal firm. Their expertise is essential in drafting precise motions for the budget and levy adoption, ensuring they reflect the specific needs and goals of the referendum. We appreciate our community's understanding as we navigate these additional steps, and we thank you for your continued support and engagement throughout this process. Okay. And Danny, we do have a copy of that for you for the newspaper for your prints. Is, is it a different statue, it's just the one that was going around on Facebook that was for uh, common school districts instead of unified? You should put in the mm -hmm. statue number so people can look. I don't... There's a different requirement for common and um, union schools than a unified school district. Yeah, I just I think it'd make people feel better if it. I think it's all SMI check. Don't quote me, but I, you just scroll like. It's all in the it's one. It's all place. in there. You just yep. have to read the headings of each. Mm -hmm. Each paragraph to see if it's talking about a. Which type of school district it's talking it's, about? And but it's pretty clear. I haven't been on it as of recent, but the last time I was, you just have to make sure you know what type of district you're reading about. Okay, moving on to item two. Danny. Yes, sir. Dr. Bardo. The other thing is all the other ones, the commons and the union districts, they have to have an annual meeting in August. And that's where district administrators guess at what the mill rate's going to be because you don't know how many kids you have. You don't know uh, what the state's going to give you and you're, you're guessing and you make your best guess in August and then at the regular board meeting in October, if it's after the 15th when they get all the no true numbers from the state, they have a motion on the regular board meeting to approve the budget, approve the levy. Where in our case, as a unified district, we don't have the annual meeting and we do it in a special meeting and we have till tonight to do it. So that's the answer. And Dr. Bardo, what you've just read or stated is in the state statutes. If Correct. I'm not mistaken, it's around 120, but don't hold me to that number. Uh, item two, board action. And uh, before we read the action items, I just want to remind the board members to please be respectful of each other's time. Uh, remember, as we are operating as a small board, uh, you'll get that time to speak. And then once your time is over to speak, uh, other board members will have the opportunity to speak before you are allowed to speak again at that same motion on the floor. Does everybody understand that? Okay, thank you. Uh, Letter A, consideration to adopt the 2024-2025 fiscal year budget. I will be looking for a motion. Motion to approve the budget as presented should the November 5th, 2024 referendum be approved by voters. Motion to approve the budget as presented should the November 5th, 2024 referendum not be approved by voters. Dr. Bartle, you have made the motions on the floor. Would you like to speak to your motions? At this time, I'd like uh, Mrs. Fossbender to introduce our uh, financial consultant so he can talk to us about the differences between the two budgets and especially about what the referendum is going to do to our budget. And the two of you can just remain seated and share that mic. Uh, 
if you would like as uh, well. Before you do that, can you just explain? So typically we always adopt the budget on this day, right? So now we're doing something different? Or it's like we have to do two because we don't know which budget we have. Okay. So we are approving them both. And that's why it says, the first thing I read said, should the referendum pass? And then you, the second one was, if the referendum doesn't pass. So we're going to have a different budget and a different levy. And Eric is going to go through and explain. I've never had to do that since I've been on the board, but that's what you have to do okay. because you don't know if it's going to pass. Okay, so we're approving them tonight. It's just two. Final approval next. No, no. It's, it's approved tonight. It's just whatever happens on Tuesday tells us which budget we're going to go from. So that's what happens every time somebody tries to pass a referendum like this? Yeah. They do two budgets. Yeah. If you do it in November, if you have one in April, you're looking at the following year. So when you make that budget, you know what you're doing. But if you have a referendum as a school district in November, yes, you have to pass two. And also, just a reminder, too, that we did consult with Quarles and Brady to make sure our motions were accurate. Okay. It just feels weird. Yes, and both of the budgets are attached within your board doc, so you can look at each one, and they're labeled. So with that, one of the things that Mrs. Ojinski discussed is that we have had significant collaboration and consultation with several, several entities, and one of those is PMA. And I have with me a director of public finance with the Eric uh, Cass from PMA. So he can discuss and answer very specific questions around the referendum and how that impacts the budget um, specifically. Yeah, I mean, I could talk all evening about it, but I know it's Friday evening. I think Dr. Bardo did a good job of kind of explaining the differences and how a November referendum, because you're required to certify your budget and levy by November 1st, the vote is obviously after that. So it is a very weird and nuance that is not normal. This will be the only time, unless you have another future November referendum, where you'll be contemplating and taking action on two budgets. Again, only one will be certified post-election once the Board of Canvassers goes through and verifies the results. So, Can I just clarify, when you say not normal, is it more so not common for Sorry. our district? It is uncommon, it's yes. It only comes up when you have a referendum. Correct. Sorry. Nope, that's okay. Thank there you. are several other districts doing this, right? Correct, now. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I have eight school districts that are um, looking at November referendums and they're all contemplating both two tax levies as well as two budgets with their boards of education or have already done so primarily since today's the deadline. Eric, uh, could you explain to the board, um, I know you set it up on based on our mill rate of 6.21 last year Correct. and now because of increased land values it will add 95 cents but could you talk about how it's laid out for the entire um, 20 some years so that and I think I, I went into it a little bit but obviously you you're the one that put it together so you should be able to talk about it better than me right no that's a very good question so when we build plans for school districts like Anago and one of the key pieces for you all it's no hidden secret is the access to equalization aid I think Dr. Barrow highlighted the fact that last year your decision strategically to shift resources to Fund 46 to increase your cost on a one-time basis yielded a $1.4 million return. So that is part and parcel to our planning. But because of the nuances, like you highlighted, where you have to levy the first year, and then your costs will go up, and then the following year, year two, in, in my example, you receive the benefit of that additional spending in your situation. So what, we're, what we've developed is a plan that really eases in your tax levy, offset by that return on state aid the second year, and get it to a flat amount. So roughly 3.7 million is what we, need, what we need from about year five or four, all the way through you know, until you're age 61, stealing from Dr. Bardo over the next 20 to 21 years. And that's a key piece because what our goal is to, is to get you a stable levy in order to repay the principal and interest because it takes out the noise of what property valuations are going to do. 
And so our hope, I, I can't predict what the future is going to hold and I can't obligate future school boards, but the hope is when your levy is flat for the repayment offset by equalization aid, which we'll talk more about, is that your mill rate will continue to drop. So the burden is not going to increase that that 95 cents 10 years from now might be 50 cents or 45 cents, all again dependent upon what equalized values look like here for the Antigo Unified School District. So I think that's a, an important piece because a lot of times sticking at that 95 cent quotient when values are going up 10 percent, we know that home um, property tax bills for businesses and homeowners would continue to increase and that's really not how we're designing the program. We're designing, if the referendum passes again, around a flat levy that will be stable for the next 21 years. It'll fluctuate a little bit in the early time because we have to phase in the impact of state aid. Um, but once we get that fully integrated in year five, it'll be flat throughout the remaining repayment of, of the principal and interest, if that makes sense. So when you say phase in, say that again, you're going to charge more in the first the t local taxpayers pay more in the first five years? It'll be well after that? The, the, the only burden to the local taxpayer is the first year, which is the 95 cents. And then what we're doing in order to repay over a period of 21 years is when the aid hits next year, that increase in aid, because we have to wait a year, we'll inch up your levy for Fund 39, again offset by that amount. So in reality, long term, we're talking about local tax impact of somewhere around that current rate of 2.6 million but again it'll be higher in terms of we need more money to repay the principal and interest over that 20-year period by statute that's the length and duration we can go out we don't have any flexibility on that so it will inch up a little bit until it gets to the full four-ish million in year six it's not going to go from 2.8 to this year all the way up to four million next year we kind of phase that in to take advantage of the second year aid coming in to offset those nominal increases until we can flatten it out through the model and keep it flat for years roughly 15 through 21, or sorry, 6 through 21 or 5 through 21. So what happens if the state changes how they aid districts? That's something that we can't predict. I mean, what we've continued to lean on is they created this funding formula that you benefit from or haven't benefited from because of your low spending in 1994, and it hasn't changed since 1994. So that came, equalization aid formula came at the advent of revenue limits, which were both created in unison in 1994, and there's been no substantial changes to either of those funding formulas, which are distinctly different um, since 1994. So again, I can't sit here and promise that nothing's going to change in the future. It's talked about every two years for every biennial budget, but I think history is our best predictor in that over 30 years it hasn't changed. What do you think the interest rate is going to, I know at the last meeting in the volume you thought it was going to be like 4.25%. 4 is that still possible now that they're going, I don't know, all around at the moment? Yeah, um, so we still feel very good about a 425. I can tell you that um, economists, which I am not one of them and I can't predict where interest rates go, believe that the Federal Reserve is going to continue to cut. They think the sweet spot is around 3.5% for the Federal Reserve. That is not synonymous in how you're accessing the market. So you're issuing tax-exempt municipal market. Those are not line to line. But we do see some trajectory in sliding of interest rates on the municipal side. It's not meaning that when the Fed goes to 350, you're going to get a 350 by any stretch. But I do think that at a 425 here today, and knowing that a second borrowing won't be contemplated probably till late 25, early 26, that the hope is is that the Fed continues to fight inflation, feels like it's under control, interest rates lower, and we'll have less exposure on the interest rate, maybe in that 350 to 375 as we get into where the Fed's going to settle in. So when you say second borrowing, we're not borrowing the whole thing right now? No. No. And there's many reasons to do that. I mean, we don't want to carry that interest for additional periods of time. You're not going to need the full $54 million right away. So we really get strategic if the referendum passes and look at the best ways to lower your um, impact on the local levy. And some of the ways of doing that, again, are spacing out borrowings. And what we really do is we look at how are the funds going to be spent. So a construction company will give us a monthly cash flow high level and we'll really strategically look at when we need to borrow so we're not over-borrowing and carrying more interest costs than we really need to. 
So there's a whole evolution of those strategies that will come post-successful referendum. We just don't have access to that information yet. Um, but post-referendum, if it does pass, we will get a lot more information. And we'll be here a lot more times talking about the different strategies and pressure points and what we see and setting up a plan that works for you guys that we feel good about. So presumably we'll have borrowed the whole thing by the time the building is done being Of course. Built? Mm -hmm. Of course. Okay. So it's much different than a house. Correct. You, yeah, when you buy a house, you get the whole money, you start paying principal and interest. We'll, we'll be strategic and layer in borrowings over time so we don't overfund it and carry that interest like I highlighted. And when you're bringing the dollar amounts, you're saying we're going to pay $4 million in a couple of years, only $2 million or something now, that's just you're making the payment more in later years, essentially? Well, we definitely will always have higher principal amounts in later years just because of the way that the levy is going to be structured. But again, we want to make sure that your repayment from a tax and state aid perspective is flat for as long as possible. Mm -hmm. So the structure of the debt certainly will evolve over time. But again, our ultimate goal is to try to flatline you guys so that you don't feel upward pressure on your levy in future years or future boards do not for that matter. We're not trying to mortgage the future on what we don't know is going to happen or not. Okay. Will you give the lecture on the tertiary and the secondary? And I know that was always Tim Prenti's favorite part of the budget hearing. He loved talking about secondary aid. I can tell you from my experience talking to him, too. I probably won't go as in-depth with him, but I can certainly touch on it. So um, a couple things that I would want to point out. So even with the aforementioned $2.4 million transfer, I'm not trying to belabor the point. We all know the impact of that. You are still $1.6 million underspent on your secondary aid. You just have no more ability to spend anymore. And so really where I go with that is that $2.4 million, and Kelly and I spoke about that, was really a one-time benefit due to ESSER. That probably isn't going to exist into the future. So your long-term trajectory without a successful referendum is underspending your secondary cap by about $4 million. And putting that into words, you get um, reimbursement at around 70%. So I wish I was better at math in my head. It's probably around $3 million that you're not receiving to offset your levy in order to do that because you don't have the ability to spend. So that is maximizing secondary aid. So really, to answer your question more pointedly, long term, you need to, the school district needs to have the resources to expend an additional $4 million in order to maximize as much state aid on the primary, which everybody gets, so nobody talks about that. And then the secondary is really indicated on each individual districts and their ability to spend. And for you guys, again, long term, it probably will grow depending upon what happens if the referendum doesn't, isn't successful. But let's benchmark that at $4 million. So finding a way to increase your spending by $4 million gets you the most positive benefit from a property tax levy offset. Then as you get into tertiary, as Kelly alluded to earlier, there's two types of districts on the tertiary level. There's the very property wealthy that spend a lot of money. You know, a lot of them are Union High School. I'll point to Arrowhead. They are negative tertiary, it's called. And so every dollar they spend, they give money back to the state of Wisconsin. So they actually lose money from year to year. So their equalization aid, rather than having a trajectory we're trying to get you guys on that's rising, they're declining over time. And what that means is that their local levy is shouldering more of a burden because in the eyes of the state of Wisconsin, they are spending a lot and they have a lot of property wealth per student. So that's their definition of property taxpayers can shoulder the burden more. You're opposite of that. So even if you get into tertiary, which again is blowing through $4 million of additional spending, just looking at a static point in time of today, um, you're going to be reimbursed still at $0.30 cents for every additional dollar above that. So you're getting 70 on that $4 million. If you spend $4.5 million, that 500000 you would get a $0.30 cent kickback rather than a 70 So there still is benefit that your taxpayers are not going to shoulder the burden of 100% of spending above the $4 million, but it's certainly at a lower reimbursement rate than what you're experiencing on that secondary level. So we used to be able to get to tertiary aid, but now we can't. Because Correct. For whatever reason, we just have less money. To spend to be yep. less students. Yep. I mean, your history is right in front of me. So 23-24, you were 2.8 million below the secondary cap. This year, you're 1.6. But again, that's a little hidden veil of the 2.4 million. I would consider it long-term 4 million. So you can see that your trajectory continues to grow due to your low property um, value per member, as well as your inability to raise revenues because of the revenue limit. So, and somebody tried to tell me that because Milwaukee passed a gigantic referendum, Somehow our taxes go up here or we get less state aid or something? 
Uh, in theory, but I, I would say that the impact for Anago Unified in your current situation is going to be negligible. The ones that are going to feel it the most are those negative tertiary school districts that are spending more. Because again, the state in where you're positioned in that secondary, and that's really where we want to keep you, right? I talked earlier um, prior to the equalization aid conversation that our goal is to get you about 3.7, 3.8 million of additional spending each year going forward, really trying to target that $4 million cap and not kick you into tertiary which is where you start feeling the ill effects of the $250 million referendum when it's, once it's phased in at MPS. Does that make sense? Sort of. Ish? <laughs> Good questions. Are there any other questions of the motion that is on the floor? I guess, so taxpayers, they're gonna still, they're gonna feel essentially 95 cents more. Um, it's not like because the property tax values went up so much, the mill rate went down a lot, so that it's gonna be a flat out wash like I was just hoping. It's not, there's still gonna be a 95 cent increase. How much, how much is the mill rate going up from last year? We'll have to save that for the next motion. Oh. It's the mill rate. Save, hold that question. Any other discussion of the motion on the floor? I do want to say um, at the convention in January, board members, they do a deep dive in school finance. They call it the school finance puzzle, and they go even deeper than what Eric has done tonight over the course of the entire convention. So if you are anywhere interested in diving deeper into school finance, I would encourage you to go and sign up for all of those classes. Sorry, just made a plug for the convention. <laughs> if there's no other questions of the motion on the floor, uh, you have your voting device in front of you. Yes, sir. Um, I clicked one button wrong, and I don't have the names associated with devices. Okay. Um, could you give me your name and number? My name and number, Pyatt7. Let's start with Jill. Maddox Nelson, four. Sure. <clears throat> Matt Miller, five. Next. Uh, Schrader, nine. No. Peterson, six. Solon, three. <coughs> Bardo, one. Excellent. Thank you. Are we ready to go? Yes. Okay, the voting device is now open of the motion on the floor. Would anyone like to change their vote? Everybody's didn't show up. There's two missing, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's correct. The vote is now closed. And the motion carries. Item letter B, consideration to approve the tax levy. I will be looking for a motion, please. Motion to set the tax levy at $7.16 per thousand for a total all-fund tax levy of $11,950,269 should the November 5th, 2024 referendum be approved by voters, whereas the tax levy be set at $5.44 per thousand for a tax levy of $9,074,000 should the November 5th, 2024 referendum not be approved by voters. Motion has been made by Scott. Scott, would you like to speak to your motion, please? No. No? This passes. 
Once again, uh, once again, we will refer back to Mrs. Fassbender and Eric for any questions that you may have of the motion on the floor. All of our discussion needs to be around the motion of setting the tax levy. Questions or discussion? Questions or discussion of the motion on the floor? Will you talk a little, Kelly, about what the what a taxpayer is going to feel now? If you're I have your average hundred thousand dollar house. So for the referendum, it would be ninety five dollars per hundred thousand per year. Okay. Which we have been talking about the entire referendum. We estimated a maximum of a dollar because we wanted to be the most conservative that we could. So we valued we the computation had to do with zero equalized valuation increase. We know that property values generally increase, but we want it to be as safe as possible. Because those went up about 10%, the mill rate went down to, or the impact would be 95 cents instead of a dollar for the referendum impact. Okay, but so normally, Tim always gave us the chart of the whole county, and I was always kind of confused, but he showed the value of the taxes going up. So can you roughly, so you're saying that the $100,000 <coughs> house went up 10%. Well, the equalized valuation, so the fair market value of all of the properties within your 19 municipalities increased. Each one of those increased at a different level because of various reasons. Um, but in total, that's that slide that I talked about, how your equalized valuation went up, meaning your mill rate then decreases. So they... Would you say it equals out then, or do people end up, I mean, do you end up the same when the values go up and the mill rate goes down? Does the tax, is it equivalent amount of taxation, or do you end up better off or worse off if the values hadn't gone up, is maybe the question I want to know the answer to? I think it's going to be pretty much the same, because again, you know, the valuation is what's causing the majority of the drop to the 95 cents. If we would stay at a dollar and your house goes up, you're going to be paying more in taxes than if it drops to the 95, right? So again, I would just hearken back to our strategy, which is keeping your levy as flat as possible. The first year is a little bit wonky because of the state aid offset that doesn't come until future years. But again, holding true to our original projections, it went down from a dollar to 95 cents, so the impact should be substantially similar. But ag again, the recommendation from administration was to allow it to drop rather than stay true to that dollar, which would have meant higher tax bills if the referendum passes than necessary, if you follow. Okay. So if somebody just owns hunting land, no mm -hmm. house on it, mm -hmm. does the mill rate, when it goes up 95 cents, mm -hmm. do, you, do you just multiply that by the value that their hunting land Yep. Up just the same as it was a house. Yep. And again, but it's going to be assessed differently on a use assessment versus a residential or commercial assessment. But yeah, so a lot lower value just for its purpose. But that would be the way to do that because mm -hmm. the mill rate is the same. It's equalized for any property owner with any of the municipal jurisdictions that you have taxing authority over. Okay. But the one thing that I always like to highlight is that, you know, equalized values may have gone up 8% or around that, but everybody's home is different, right? We're talking at the macro sense, so sometimes people look at their tax bill. They may have done an addition to their home or something unpredictable that increased their home value. We're looking at the aggregate across all of your communities on average. Okay. So if somebody's house value went up a lot and the mill rate goes up, they're, their impact's going to be different, be right? Worse. Yeah. But again, we can't predict that. We have to look at your community and every community as a whole because we don't know what each individual home or residence or commercial property is doing from an assessed perspective. And just to circle back a little bit to that historical mill rates chart that I talked about. So as recently as fall of 2020, the mill rate was at $8. And so with a referendum passing, it would be seven dollars and sixteen cents, just to put it into perspective a little right. bit. Right, but it's easy, it's harder for me to, you know, it's easy to say, look, the mill rate's going down, but they care about total taxes. Yep. Right. So if the values were just a lot lower, then, you know, the chart would be better if it said, you know, 
theoretically, are the taxes, have they been going down, down, down because we've been levying less? No, if not necessarily. Put, I think it's a product of two things. Number one, throwing out the low revenue ceiling lift, which was an anomaly that continues, right, that we all, I mean, it was discussed earlier. You know, two things have really driven your mill rate down over time. Number one, what you're highlighting is property values. Over the last two years, not this year, but in 23 and 22, every school district saw hyperinflation in property valuations, right? So that's a real thing and one of the biggest drivers over the last two years. But I also, looking at your history, your enrollment has certainly declined substantially over time. So your levy, of course, is going down. So I think it's a product of two things. Number one, the total levy received, again, outside of that low revenue lift that was a one-time thing that we discussed, you certainly have seen your levy going down over time, which kind of all comes full circle to your inability to spend to get to the levels on the equalization aid. You just don't have the revenue because your students are declining, and so your ability to tax has gone down over time, which you've seen your levy go down as well. Okay. So is it true we no longer get the hold harmless when our, we used to, like, when we lost students? You do, yep. So for this year, so there's a one-year exemption for declining enrollment. And for this year, putting it into perspective, you're getting an additional half a million of spending authority within your general fund. So there, again, is going to be a half a million that's not going to exist in 25-26 because you get a one-year reprieve due to declining enrollment. So it's a one-time thing. So next year, your tax levy, all things being equal, would probably be $500,000 or less. Now, we don't know what the legislature is going to do in the Benio budget, but just holding static this year, you're going to lose half a million dollars of taxing authority next year just because of your declining enrollment that you get that one-year reprieve on. So, yes, you are correct, but it does go away. Okay. But I did, it didn't go away completely. Like, we still get it. I just thought we were going to stop getting it at some point, but you, nope, know, you it just continues. keep getting it yep. every time. Unless they change it in the next biennium, which we don't know. It has been there for 10, 15 years. I might be out of questions. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions of the motion on the floor? I don't have a question, excuse me, but a statement just because declining enrollment is a really important um, topic in terms of taxpayer interest and feedback. Um, in talking about declining enrollment and referendum, if we were to bring students back that are open and rolling out, we physically do not have the space in our current buildings to bring them back. So when we talk about declining enrollment, but why is the district asking for a referendum? How, how do you not have space in the buildings? We don't for several reasons. We've shared that numerous times in presentations and it's available online. But the point is too, talking about, or the talking point of declining enrollment also means we physically do not have the, the space and capacity to bring students back into a district that we have lost and we are paying out money for that. So I just think that's important to note within the context of this conversation because it arguably doesn't make sense um, with declining enrollment and the need for new build, but then putting it in perspective, I just want to share that. Yeah, they're leaving because we don't have room for it. That's one of the reasons. Another piece is that taxpayer money is being levied for those students that are open and rolled out and going into all other districts, Elko, Wittenberg, Burnham Wood, we have a significant amount of our taxpayer money that is being paid out to other school districts, which would then come back to our school. As those students choose to return. Correct. Mm -hmm. So that had, would have a positive effect on the mill rate? It wouldn't change, it would you would change. just retain it, yeah. Right. So it wouldn't, yeah, earning. so we would be able be to, good, yeah. yeah. So instead yeah. of writing a check out to right. Elko School District, we would be able to keep that check. That's all the taxpayer money. Yeah. Any other discussion of the motion on the floor? Dr. Bardo? No matter what happens on Tuesday, and I'm, I'm hopeful that our community will vote yes, because we've made a commitment as a board. It's been 21 months. The only one who wasn't on the board was Mr. Peterson and, and at that time, and we basically said, 
we needed to do a study on our district's buildings. We've had two task forces. The first task force said we need to build a new elementary school. The second task force said we need to uh, put out a referendum which would include that new building plus $8 million for security things at the high school and the middle school. And I also want to comment that I've never seen a school run a referendum like this. And in that, I mean the board and the district administrative team going out to all the municipalities, going out to all the clubs in this city, and taking the time to go out and attempt to explain why this needs to happen. And I just want to, as the person who put this out 21 months ago that we needed to look at our buildings, I want to thank this board, every one of you including Scott, who has joined us, and Mrs. Oginski's administrative team, you've done a tremendous job. And if they tell us no, then we're gonna have to come up with plan B. But I don't wanna do a plan B. What we've done should make this referendum pass, and I wanna thank everybody who's been involved. So with that, I'm done talking tonight. Dr. Bartle, thank you for those words because uh, the hours are very many that Mrs. Ojinski and her team has put into the miles that they have driven over the county uh, of making this proposal and answering the hard questions and facing some tough people in our community with some questions. And uh, I've been to some of those meetings and uh, I will say that Mrs. Ojinski and her team uh, had an answer for all of their questions that our community had and, um, and would back up and punt and change direction as needed along the way. So thank you for your team uh, for doing all of the extra hard work and legwork that you have done along with all of your team. And if I name their names, I'll miss somebody. So I'm just gonna say your team. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, and also to the board members, because several of you, I know Jill spent many nights with us. Scott spent many nights with us and doing various other things, reaching out to other contacts that he had. And Dr. Bardo also with his background with finance, it, it takes a team. And it was all of us. Kristen coming up with some great ideas, me haggling J.D. to tap into his email list. <laughs> I didn't do much, but good job, everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, my team. I, it's not possible without them. I think I have the best team. All right, having said all of that, I believe we have given enough time for discussion. The voting device is now open of the motion on the floor. Would anyone like to change their vote? The vote is now closed. And the motion carries. Item number three, closed session. Consideration of a motion to adjourn into closed session pursuant to section 19.85 subsection one of the Wisconsin statutes for the purpose of considering uh, subsection C, employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of any public employee over which the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercises responsibility. I would be looking for a motion, please. So motion has been made by Jill. Would you like to speak to your motion? No, thank you. Uh, any discussion of the motion on the floor? Hearing no discussion of the motion on the floor, Deanna will have a roll call vote, please. Kristen Mattmiller? Yes. Scott Peterson? Yes. Catherine Solon? Yes. Angie Schreiber? J.D. Schrader? Yes. Bobby Braun? Dr. Bardot? Yes. Danny Pyatt? Yes, we are now in, uh, wait a minute. Oh, Jill Maddock, Nelson, I oh. Yes, you're okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to make sure it was on record. Uh. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. We are now in closed session.